UK's first extreme heat warning. Average summers will typically contain one or two really, really hot spells, and that's become almost the new normal for the British weather. Doing our bit for nature. Whether you're a Met Office or just a school or an individual homeowner, we can all do something in our own space. And what next for the summer of 2021? There will be a zone across parts of the south where we are really quite concerned about torrential downpours. It's Friday the 23rd of July and you're listening to Weathersnap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir and this is Weathersnap, the insider's guide to the week's weather headlines. This week saw the UK's first extreme heat warning issued by the Met Office. So what's the idea of the new warning system and why now? To find out, I spoke to Will Lang, Head of Civil Contingency Services. We haven't had a Met Office warning for heat before. We've known for quite a long time that really hot conditions, that has major implications for health in particular, especially for the more vulnerable members of our community, so the very old, uh, the very young, people with underlying health conditions. We also know that in recent years, in particular, spells of extreme heat are becoming more frequent, uh, more long-lasting, and indeed hotter um, in the UK. And even that some of the, the very mixed, indeed average summers that we've had in recent years will typically contain one or two really, really hot spells. And that's become almost the new normal for the British weather. So we thought that we needed to do something about that. We needed to get that advice to people to help make their decisions about how to keep themselves safe in extreme heat. It's not just about temperature, is it? Because this week we've seen extreme heat warnings across Wales, the West Midlands, West Country, Northern Ireland, when in fact the East Midlands, the South East, have had similar temperatures. That's a really good point, Claire. It's not just about those headline maximum temperatures that you might see in the forecasts. For instance, the hottest temperature we had last summer uh, was just in a very brief spell of hot weather when we got 38 point something at Heathrow. But actually, the most impactful weather we had last summer was a more prolonged but less hot heat wave. And actually, that's similar to what we've got at the moment. So we're looking at a few things. We're looking at uh, where is the heat most prolonged? Where is it most unusual? So in this case, it was western and some northwestern parts of the UK where it's just not used to getting uh, 30 degree heat, for example. And also, yeah, how long lasting it day and night. So it's not just those headline maximum temperatures. It's the fact that it doesn't cool down at night. So you get several days of prolonged high temperatures where the temperature does not drop below 20 degrees at all. Hot weather in the UK, I would say, is quite bittersweet, isn't it? Some people really embrace it, particularly this year with staycation last year as well, and others can't cope with it at all. And there are those who say it's an extreme heat warning. What is this? Is this a nanny state? Are you telling us how to suck eggs? I mean, are we in a really tricky situation here in the Met Office? I think what we're seeing here is that we want to give as much advice to people as possible so that they can make their own decisions. As you said, Claire, there's a huge range of reactions to heat. I mean, my my personal perception of it is that I like uh, probably two or three days of reasonably warm weather in the mid 20s, possibly high 20s. And anything more than that or anything prolonged than that, um, I don't like it. So I think it starts to affect us all when we have um, a situation like this. And it's useful to have some advice not just aimed at the vulnerable in the community, but advice as to how we all might look at those effects of heat, noting that things are becoming more frequent and we're more likely to see conditions we're not as used to. So that might be just simple advice about keeping hydrated, putting sunscreen on, staying safe in water, because that can be a real danger issue in times of really hot weather, looking after your animals, but also looking after vulnerable members of our community and checking in on them and things like that. So we're not telling people what to do. We're just helping people make their own decisions as how to react to heat. Will Lang talking to me earlier. While present weather conditions may be challenging for the human population, spare a thought for the UK's wildlife. As well as the current hot spell, our natural environment is increasingly having to deal with the effects of climate change. Here at Met Office HQ, all our grounds are managed for the benefit of wildlife, and this is the 10th year we've achieved the Wildlife Trust's Biodiversity Benchmark Award. On a recent visit, Devon Wildlife Trust CEO, Harry Barton, gave his impressions of our habitat efforts and explained the value of the benchmark scheme. 
I was really pleasantly surprised because I walked around this site and when you first come in, you see in many ways, it's like an awful lot of other buildings. But as I went a little bit off piece and I saw your incredible wildflower meadow, I saw your bee orchids, I saw your ponds. It was such a great example of how a space in the middle of a city can be good for wildlife. And that meadow is just inspiring. The idea behind the biodiversity benchmark was really to have an equivalent for biodiversity that farmers do with organic farming, to have a set of robust standards by which we can measure uh, performance. And I think the importance of that is that it's very easy to say, I'm doing my bit for wildlife. And that can vary, that can be one extreme, can be rewilding a huge estate, and the other is putting out a, a window box. And really we needed to have some standards so we could say these are things that organisations are doing, these are things organisations are not doing. The biodiversity benchmark isn't just dished out, you have to work towards it and it's evidence-based and we're not frightened to withdraw it if we don't think people aren't doing what they should be doing. Great range of organisations out there have got the biodiversity benchmark, so water companies, quarrying companies, airports like Heathrow and Gatwick, some quarrying companies have got it, aggregate industries and of course uh, the Met Office, scientific organisations. So what's in it for the organisations who want to work towards the biodiversity benchmark? Well, a number of things. I think in the first instance, it can send a really good message to your customers, your shareholders, your stakeholders, that you are doing your bit to tackle one of the great challenges of our time, which is the loss of biodiversity, the ecological crisis. Secondly, it can do an awful lot for your staff. You wander around the grounds here. I mean, what a perfect pleasure. You know, would you want to be wandering around among these grasses and trees and ponds and meadows? Or would you prefer to wander around noisy concrete and tarmac? And thirdly, I think it's about business efficiency. So if you work your land less hard, if you mow it less often, if you manage your buildings in a more environmentally sustainable way, it can save you money as well as carbon emissions. There are a number of things that really affect our wildlife here in Devon. The way we manage land, of course, is one of them. The topography is one, another. But of course, the climate is changing. Um, it's changing all the time. We're feeling some of those pressures now. And two areas where we really see that are in our uplands, where we have some of the most southerly bogs anywhere in the world. As the climate warms and dries, there is real pressure on the future of those bogs. And they are so important, not just for wildlife, but also for our water supply. So why do we all need to do our bit and create more space for nature? Well, I think the most powerful argument is that we need to double the overall area that we're managing for wildlife if we're going to hang on to what we've got, let alone bring in anything new. We need to get to that 30% magic figure. Even in a wonderful rural county like Devon with so much going for it, two national parks and all our coasts, we are way, way off that target. And that means that everyone, whether you're a national park authority or whether you're the local train company or the Met Office or just a, a school or an individual homeowner, we all have to do something towards this. And we can all do something in our own space. Head of Devon Wildlife Trust, Harry Barton. And if you'd like to sign up your business or organisation to the Biodiversity Benchmark Scheme, visit wildlifetrust.org. While a change from current dry conditions may be welcomed by gardeners and wildlife alike, but a shift to wetter weather may come as something of a mixed blessing. Here with the outlook for the next few days, Alex Deacon. Big changes with the weather over the weekend for some parts of the UK. Now, for Scotland and Northern Ireland, actually, the weekend is set fair. It's not going to be quite as hot, but still very warm and generally fine and sunny as well, although mist or ha will still persist across parts of eastern Scotland. Now, it's across England and Wales where we're going to see more of a dramatic change. An area of low pressure is moving in. That is bringing the moisture. Moisture combined with the heat energy that we've been talking about. Well, that is going to spark some pretty intense downpours. So we're looking at showers breaking out on Friday night and extending their way slowly northwards across southern England and Wales. And then on Saturday, there will be a zone across parts of the south where we are really quite uh, concerned about torrential downpours. They will be localised, but we could see a zone, say, from the southwest of England up into South Wales, across the Midlands, towards East Anglia, where torrential downpours and large hailstones are likely. That could cause some local issues. We've already got uh, warnings in place covering the risk of the downpours. We'll firm up on those and fine-tune the warnings as we get closer to the time, because they will be somewhat localised, these downpours. 
as they often are in the summer months. So very much hit and miss, but some places seeing torrential rain on Saturday. Uh, generally quite showery across the southern half of the UK, uh, but I suspect much of northern England will still be fine on Saturday. By Sunday, well, the low pressure is still with us, slowly ebbing away, but still likely to provide some heavy showers. Again, more particularly across England and Wales, but more particularly across central and eastern parts. And at the moment, the downpours on Sunday don't look quite as severe as the ones on Saturday, but still the risk of very heavy rain, uh, lightning and thunder as well. With all the cloud around, even though the air is still pretty warm, temperatures aren't going to be as high. But we could still, where the sun does poke out, uh, get up into the uh, mid or even high 20s across the southeast. Probably feeling pretty sticky and humid this weekend as well, even though temperatures won't be as high. That slowly clears away that low pressure system, but it may head up towards Scotland for the early part of the new working week, still providing some heavy rain here on Monday and Tuesday. And generally next week, uh, a different weather regime, looking generally cooler with a continued likelihood of showers. Thanks, Alex. Just before we go, here's Ollie Clayton with last week's highs and lows. Here are the UK weather extremes for the week beginning Monday the 12th of July. The highest daily temperature was Heathrow in London, reaching 31.6 Celsius on Sunday the 18th. Kinbrace in Caithness recorded the lowest minima of the week on Tuesday at 6.3 Celsius. Tyree on the Western Isles had the wettest 24 hours. This was on Monday the 12th of July when 55 millimetres was recorded and Bulma in Northumberland had the sunniest day on Saturday with 15.4 hours of sunshine. Thanks, Ollie. That's it for Weather Snap. I'm Claire Nazir. Editor is Adrian Holloway. Weather Snap is a podcast by the UK Met Office.